This is the front line of a jungle war being fought in Peru's mountainous no man's land. These soldiers are battling against an old enemy in one of its last strongholds, Viscatan, a thick jungle area of around 185 square miles. But the army's been able to establish five bases here, and their leader, General Raimundo Flores, is confident the enemy can be beaten. Eh, en los próximos años, si hablamos de acá tres, cuatro años, yo veo a los cabecillas de Sendero Luminoso en la cárcel. In the next few years, the Shining Path leaders will be in prison, and the Shining Path's ideological appeal here or in any other part of Peru will be finished. It will be buried, and those that remain free will just be a gang of drug traffickers. General Flores says his troops killed around 20 guerrilla fighters in their latest operations, but four soldiers have lost their lives. Just some of the 25 military and police killed by the guerrillas in the last year. Experienced guerrilla fighters and well armed with money from the drugs trade, the Shining Path's other advantage is the booming cocaine business in the lush Apurimac River Valley, on the Amazon's margin with Peru's Andes Mountains. Lo, lo que dice Maquiavel, el enemigo de mi enemigo es mi amigo, como que un poquito se extiende a más, ¿no? El, As Machiavelli says, the, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Cabrero. The drug trafficker is the friend of the coca farmer, and the Shining Path guerrilla is the friend of the drug trafficker. So all three are friends, and we who represent the state stand against all of them. The economy of this valley is based on the coca leaf, so as such this is a low-intensity war where 10% is military and 90% is political. The armed forces are trying to win hearts and minds in poor and isolated communities like Sanabamba, in Viscatan. Until recently, these people saw more of the shining path than they did of the state. One of the village leaders, Froilan Gutierrez, says the rebels have changed. Before, he explains, they killed men, women and children and stole livestock. Now, when they pass through, they pay for what they need and invite the villagers to join them in a game of football. The authorities in Peru call them narco-terrorists and say they no longer have an ideology. The guerrillas themselves reject the group's brutal past and say they now protect civilians. But Antonio Cardenas, a leader of the valley's civil militia, which fought the guerrillas for almost two decades, is skeptical. Cardenas says they appear to have changed, but he believes they're still the same bloodthirsty killers who used to kill whole communities, regardless of age or gender. Peru is the world's second producer of cocaine, and UN figures say it made around 180 tons last year. Around half came from the Apurimac River Valley. Farmers here grow coca, and 90% of their crops go to make cocaine, yet most of them don't see any of the profits. Maribel Contreras is one of them. Others get fat on the coca we grow in this valley, but we are far from rich. We are just trying to survive. Observers say addressing the issue of poverty and sense of abandonment by the state in this valley is just as important as taking back territory if the government is to finally overcome the shining path. Journalist Gustavo Garitti has covered the movement since its beginnings 30 years ago. Even though they seem at this point to confine themselves mostly uh, to regional uh, operations, the fact is that they have slowly grown in terms of of operational reach and presence. I don't think that because of the reaction of the Peruvian state at this point, they can't expect to continue growing. Just a fraction of its former size, but buoyed by the drugs trade, the Shining Path continues to expand. So far, it has managed to stay one step ahead of the Peruvian state.